Welcome back. I hope you're all having a good start to the week. I will get right down to it this week. One of the most underappreciated, under the radar triumphs that's come out in the past 30 years. This is a bike that's been underappreciated for so long and in my eyes too, because when I was contacted about this bike, I had to do 10 to 15 minutes research to find out even what it is. But I hope over the next couple of minutes to persuade you that this should be one of the, the key bikes that you should be considering if you're on the hunt for a real, authentic, beautiful looking character bike. This would be so high up on my list now if I were genuinely considering a bike. This is from Colru in Belgium. Freddy, what's your opinion on the Triumph Legend TT900? On paper, it looks like a fun cruiser, three cylinder with classic styling for not a lot of money here in Belgium, around about 3,250 euros. Let me give you a bit of a backstory, an overview on this bike. Built only, only from 1998 to the year 2000. That's a production run of only about three years. It's got 70 horsepower and it's 900 cc. But here's the special bit. Triumph, as we know it, were reborn in 1983. Five years after that, John Bloor, the owner of Triumph, decided to put a lot of money into building a brand new English factory in Hinckley, where all Triumphs were to be made. Three years after that point, in 1991, the first bikes rolled off the production line in Hinckley, England. 11 years after that point, in 2002, Triumph decided to invest a lot of money and open up factories in Thailand. And this is where the production started to shift from made in England bikes to made in Thailand bikes. So if you want one of the real, genuine, English made Triumphs, you need to be looking at 1983 onwards, but for the Hinkley ones, 1991 onwards, up until around about 2002 to 2004 model bikes, give or take a few years for different models. My point being, this Triumph Legend TT900 was one of the bikes 100% made in England in Hinkley. And that has provenance. That has weight associated to it. That's a bit of triumph history right there. That's a huge part of why this bike is so special. But how much, how much can you get one of these bikes for in the classifieds? Surely it's got to be, it's got to be £5,000 or so I was thinking before checking. Before I get to that point, I know what you're thinking. You're going to be thinking, yes, but I want a bike that's reliable. I want a bike that potentially I could use on big Euro trips. And a 25-year-old Triumph is not one of those bikes. But I think you could be wrong. And more importantly, MCN thinks you could be wrong. Have a listen to this on the reliability section of the bike. Quoting here from MCN. Like most early Hinkley Triumphs, the Thunderbird family benefited from engineering paranoia. Bear in mind, I'm just interjecting here. Triumph, in essence, went bust because the Japanese destroyed the British biking industry because they were just so much better. So when Triumph were to finally come back and release bikes, they needed to make sure that these were really good, reliable bikes. And they didn't make the same mistakes they made back in the 60s and 70s that killed off British biking. I continue. Engineering par paranoia to the extent that the Triumph Legend TT is massively over-engineered, under-stressed, and pretty durable too. In the classified, so now I'm, I've got my mind set at ease here. How much can I find one of these really beautiful, and I do mean beautiful bikes. This would stand up in any modern showroom. It's got the elegant classic British styling. The quality looks beautiful. The dimensions and proportions, everything looks perfect. And I've got two here. 
I'll start with one that blew my mind, so much so that if I knew this bike existed when I bought my Bonneville, I promise you this would have been neck and neck to what I'd have chosen. I almost can't believe it. Someone must pick this up. You must. It's coming up to March. Summer is just around the corner, relatively speaking. And here's a bike that you could keep for years. 1998, the first year of, of sale of these bikes, Triumph Legend. The price, £2,250. I'll say that one more time, £2,250. Beautiful to ride. Sounds like a squadron of Lancaster bombers flying past. I mean, if that is not a sales pitch, I don't know what is. It's got MOT till May and it's only ridden 400 miles since its last annual check. And that's not a freak. There are plenty of other bikes at around about the £3,000 mark. Here's one more, for example, listed three weeks ago. Because no one knows about these, this is the point, no one knows about these bikes. No one will type in, oh, I want a Triumph Legend because people just don't know about it. So if you want this one here, Listed three weeks ago, price reduced from 3,600 to 3,000 pounds. It's a 1999 model, 49,000 miles on the clock, just three grand. And the mileage shows that these are fine at higher mileage, almost 50,000 miles. And that looks like it's just been pushed out of the dealership. It's got a backrest, beautiful chrome, spoked wheels. It's perfect. Any owners, past or present, let me know how good are these legends and how ridiculous are the prices on them at the moment. Moving on, the real cost of running a bike. Ooh, this is from Richard, this is interesting. Could you do a piece on the real cost of motorcycle ownership, i.e. dealership service charges? I've just let my 2021 model Kawasaki Ninja 1000 XS go as the 15,000 mile service is 935 pounds. Modern motorcycle services are horrendous. I imagine your bike of the week, the Kawasaki Supercharged ZH2, would be even higher. Also, there's another issue with annual services, that they're required at the mileage specific service period too. I'm led to believe that some valve clearance or some valve servicing costs for modern Triumph Tigers can hit 1,500 pounds and are required in a relatively short mileage duration. I'd appreciate your time and thoughts on the matter. Obviously, some may have the knowledge, kit and premises to service their machines, but if you are an owner using a dealership to service your bikes, you could be in for a big monetary surprise. I really want to hear from any of you, any of you who have horror stories with regards to service, maintenance, repair costs. What's the biggest, most insanely out there quote or cost you've had to pay to get your bike sorted. I do actually have two bits of insight, Richard, here. The first is from MH. I begin, Japanese bike servicing hasn't been cheap at main dealers for decades. Honda, VFR, valve clearance check, anyone? I was quoted 1,600 pounds by a dealer. They learnt from the European brands that customers would cough up £150 for an oil and filter service that anyone can do themselves, and that putting service information into the bike's ECU was a neat way to nag riders back to the dealer for servicing and threats of no warranty support. BMW does have a somewhat undeserved reputation for expensive parts and servicing, but None of the major brands are significantly cheaper. I'll do one more from Alan. Don't worry. Don't worry. A fuel pump on a BMW is over 460 pounds. A clutch is over 900 pounds. A fuel regulator 
Well, that's over a hundred. So just stick to Japanese bikes. You will save a fortune. Most BMW centers are now on 120 pounds an hour. On now to Tet. What is Tet? I hear you ask. Well, I was on a, a ride over to Morocco last year, jumping on the ferry, and I met two British riders. And I asked them, where are you going? And they said, oh, we're, we're off to start the Tet. And I was too embarrassed to query what the Tet was. So I, I nodded and said, well, that sounds brilliant. Have fun. And after our chat about the Tet, I quickly Googled what the Tet was. It is the Trans-European Trail. I've never properly done enough research into this, but now I have, it is one of the key things I want to do. I'm going to do a few quotes here from Tet's website to explain what this is, because this looks like it could be, depending on whatever one you do, and there are so many choices, a ride of a lifetime. Quoting here, the Tet is created by motorcycle riders for motorcycle riders as a free, this is the key, a free to download and use route comprised of open, legal to ride trails and roads. So if I open up the TET website here, on the homepage, this is so user friendly. Don't think that if you live in a really flat country and you think there's nowhere to ride off road that you're going to be missing out here, you're not. Every single country in Europe is right here. You click on one of the pictures corresponding to the country you want to go to and you can download that free GPX file with all of the route. And this is almost all off-road. Doesn't matter if you want to go to Albania, Austria, Belarus, Lithuania, Hungary, Montenegro, Macedonia, Kosovo. It's got everything. Clicking onto what is Tet, listen to this. The Trans-Euro Trail is a cultural dirt road adventure from deep within the Arctic Circle to the doorstep of Africa and back. Compromising over 100,000 kilometers of dirt road, the Trans-Euro Trail is an epic motorcycle journey through some of Europe's most remote, diverse and inspirational landscapes. Influenced by the pioneering Trans-America Trail, the Trans-Euro Trail encourages riders to travel light and experience the rich diversity of Europe's land and culture. Suddenly, for me, there is nothing I would rather do than this trail. I need to have a look at some potential off-road options in Romania and maybe hit some of those when I get my Bonneville back for a summer road trip. This is all free to use. You can give a donation to them for their hard work, but it's all free to use. There's no forced payment here. It's just people doing it from the goodness of their hearts. And you get to see all of these European countries from an off-road point of view, dissecting, traversing these unbelievable, stunning bits of European scenery, off-road bits, mountainsides, you name it, it's got it. My mind has been completely blown by the breadth of options available here and how user-friendly the website is. It looks phenomenal. Ceramic coating. I move on. This is from last week, a Polish rider. I'm sure he's a Polish rider. Got in touch with me. He's got a, a lovely, fairly new BMW GS 1250 and he's considering protecting his pride and joy with ceramic coating but he has heard a very mixed bag in terms of feedback from people. Some saying they swear by it. Every bike should have it because it will protect the bike comprehensively. And other people saying, look, it's just a complete waste of money. Don't bother. I've got a few bits of insight. Vast majority of people, I didn't know what to expect here, seem to rate it highly and be generally positive about ceramic coating. Here's a general overview. This is... From Belgium again, actually, Moto Detail. I put his Instagram page up here, and you can check out some examples of the detailing and ceramic coating he does. Freddie, as a professional detailer, I feel like I had to respond to the topic of ceramic coating a motorcycle. Ceramic coating is not the miracle product some make it out to be. 
It does not make a motorcycle scratch proof and it does not make it so that you'll never have to clean your bike again, damn it. Okay, there goes the main selling point for me. Ah, clean it again, okay, okay, I'll, I'll carry on. And it can be removed if you are not careful, for example, using a motorbike cleaner that's too aggressive. But that being said, it certainly is one of the best ways to protect the paintwork plastics and metal parts of a bike. It creates a very thin and hard protective layer that lasts a long time and protects against things like discoloration, bird droppings, water spots, and so on. I have also been able to test a ceramic coating on the bike of a client that lives near the Belgian coast and where his previous uncoated bike had a lot of rust after three years of use, the difference with his current coated bike is quite profound. Sam says this, I used to coat my ceramic coat, my Ducati Monster 696 and also my Honda Magma 750. But with my Triumph Explorer, I haven't bothered. As far as I could tell, the difference made isn't massively noticeable to the protection or also the ease of future further cleans. Simon says, I get all of my vehicles ceramic coated and cleaning is a doddle with dirt coming off much easier. But beware, it doesn't solve a rust issue if the finish of your bike is substandard. Next, if your vehicle is left open to the elements, i.e. not garaged, then the coating will not last as long as claimed. And finally, the price you'll be quoted depends on the time scale you want the coating to last. That is typically one, three or five years. Having all of my many vehicles coated for the past five years, I've never found a 10 year product that could actually live up to the claim. Three years is about the maximum amount of protection, assuming it's not in the garage. It is well worth it, but with reservations. The first hyperbike, certainly the first, what would it be? It'll be the first hyperbike full stop, I'm sure. This is from Aaron, pictures of his pride and joy attached. I'd love to suggest a bike for your bike of the week. Aaron, this, this was so close, but the competition was fierce this week. I had that Triumph legend. I've got this bike, and now I've got something I've been overexcited about for the past week to share as bike of the week. But this is the penultimate section, the almost, almost bike of the week. Yes, it's a Honda, I'm continuing with Aaron, but, what I think is amazing about this bike is just how much you get for the money. Once the world's fastest production motorcycle, you can now pick one up for less than £2,000. It is none other than the Honda CBR 1100 XX Super Blackbird. I upgraded from a VFR 800 a few years ago, and I have not looked back. The Blackbird has it all. Reliability, surprising comfort, beautifully smooth power delivery, insane speeds, allegedly, but also very elegant. As for mileage, mine's just ticked over 70,000 miles and runs beautifully. Is there a better real world, modern type bike that you can purchase for around 2,000 pounds. Pictures attached so you can see how well she's aged. Uh, Aaron, I will give it to you. That looks beautiful. It looks beautiful full stop, but considering the mileage is 70,000, that's a testament to Honda build quality and the owner's care over the past, what could it be, two decades plus. The only problem, Aaron, with the Blackbird is another Japanese bike and the bike that took the crown from Blackbird, the Suzuki Hayabusa. Someone mentioned this to me a few months ago and I always forget to mention it. This is the best name or one of the best names I've ever heard in motorcycling, not just because it sounds good on its own right or in its own right, but because of where the name came from. Hayabusa in Japanese means peregrine falcon. 
And one of their favourite foods, the favourite prey of the peregrine falcon, is the blackbird. So as a big middle finger to Honda and the blackbird, Suzuki came out the Hayabusa, named it so to show them who the real new boss was for the hyperbikes. Hayabusa, blackbird killer. What a name. Now I can surely only buy a, a Suzuki Hayabusa. I could never consider a blackbird just because of that. I mean, it is quite the sales pitch. And I am a sucker for a sales pitch, Aaron, regardless of the Suzuki, that is, that's a beautiful looking blackbird. Really, really lovely. On now to the bike of the week. When I was getting overexcited last week at Wars Harley Davidson, and believe me, I almost collapsed through excitement. I was chatting to John War, the managing director, the owner. And his bike of choice from the new lineup is the Harley Davidson Street Glide. He's a proper through and through biker. He's got a big dealership. He's really successful. But he doesn't come in in a car. He doesn't even go on public transport. He rides to work filtering through London traffic every day on a brand new Harley Street Glide. And if it's good enough for John War, then this is good enough for me. But these are not cheap bikes. It's around about £27,000 for one of these. And I've got experience riding one of these. I rode around the Las Vegas desert on one of these. All in black, speakers either side of the handlebar, huge fairing protecting you from the, the wind turbulence, hard panniers either side, two up comfort all day long. I felt incredible on this bike. I've rarely felt so incredible on a motorcycle. The sense of adventure and occasion was, was something that's very addictive. And just the feeling it gave me there was enough of a reason to buy one of these bikes. I think they are phenomenal. But what can we get? £27,000 brand new now. I found one and I cannot believe the coincidence in what I found around about an hour ago. It's a 2016 model, private seller. Street Glide for £11,700. And believe me, that is a really, really good deal on one of these. It's got 40,000 miles on the clock. And have a listen to the seller's description. Just been, this is, there is no better, more perfect kind of bike to buy than this here. This is just music to my ears when I read it out. Just been fully serviced with a fresh MOT annual check. Really good condition, mainly used for touring. I've just upgraded to a Street Glide ST. That's the reason I'm selling. I've owned it from new, supplied by Wars London. Wars Harley Davidson. So it's a one owner bike, fully serviced, beautiful condition. And it was, it was sold from Europe's oldest Harley Davidson dealership. So beautiful all in black. And for, for one of these, I promise you, a tantalizing price. I'm going to be doing some daydreaming about this bike. Oh, I'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching this week's episode. Have a brilliant week all. And I'll speak to you all in the next one.